to frame the discussion on Messien, there are a few questions I'd like to pose. First, how is representation achieved in something like Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony versus the Catalog of Birds? Do Messiaen and Beethoven have different musical intents? Or is it just the musical outcome that's different? What's the role of science in an artist's depiction of nature, if any? He began notating bird songs as a teenager because he believed they represented the eternal voice of God. On an internment camp train in transit to Gerlitz, Germany, Messiaen showed clarinetist Henri Akoka a composition for solo clarinet. It was quite a thorny piece, full of irregular rhythms, high pitches, and pianissimo entrances. I'll never be able to play it, Akoka said. It's impossible. In the preceding notes to Akoka's solo movement, which was entitled Abyss of the Birds, Messiaen wrote, The birds are the opposite of time. They represent our longing for light for stars, for rainbows, for jubilant song. Akoka premiered the full piece with Messiaen at the piano, Jean Le Boulard on violin, and Etienne Pasquier on cello, in the rain for 400 fellow prisoners. We know that to be the premiere, of course, of the quartet from the end of time. With only a couple of exceptions, it took Messiaen more than 10 years to re revisit the idea of incorporating his birdsong notations into large-scale musical works. With Le Mer Noir, the Blackbird, in 1952, birdsong could be found in nearly every work through the end of that decade. During travels, he could be seen outdoors on walks, transcribing birdsongs onto manuscript paper which is why Catalogue d'Oiseau became a fitting way to geographically cycle through regional landmarks and native birds of France. Throughout the 13 movements of the catalogue, Messiaen included depictions of land, sea, and mountains, as well as bird calls from over 80 species of birds. The order of the movement cycles clockwise from the eastern French Alps to the southern Spanish border to the northern coast, where one can hear the Eurasian curlew. His physiognomy is dualistic. Of course, we know Messiaen's identity as a composer, the man who wrote such works as, as the Quartet for the End of Time and the Terangalila Symphony. But this was also the same man who would sign letters as Olivier Messiaen, ornithologist. Throughout his travels in Australia, Messiaen would introduce himself not as a composer, but as an ornithologist and rhythmician. He met one Australian birdsong scholar who even wrote, What a great ornithologist was lost by his concentrating on music. If we turn to the score of the Catalogue of Birds, we can find a plethora of instances of Messiaen, the scientist, in his meticulous labeling of each bird's French name whenever it appears in the music. Each bird's Latin name is also listed in the appendix of each score. In fact, every successive musical idea corresponds with an extra musical idea. The result, hundreds of annotations in the score, has been described by some as obsessive. In a cheeky article entitled Olivier Messiaen's Catalogue d'Oiseau, a musical dumb show, Jeremy Thurlow writes, Quote, the rule which prevails throughout two and a half hours of the catalog is that every musical idea represents something particular and is named. There's no room for music which is at all vague or indeterminate with regards to program. End quote. Opposite of this scientific impulse of the identification and labeling of species, we have Messiaen the Romantic. After all, he used music to represent nature something he deemed spiritual and eternal. In this sense, he continued on the wave of programmatic composers such as Strauss, Liszt, and Scriabin. Certain orchestral works have been compared to Strauss's Tot und Verklärung, and his piano work Van Regard sur la Jesu has been compared to the works of Franz Liszt. 
whose output I would almost always classify as programmatic or character-driven. At the same time that Messiaen prints the name of the species each time a new bird enters the music, he also includes a subjective stance or his feelings about the sound quality or emotional states of different birds. Underneath nearly every bird utterance, there are very human descriptions, whether that be ferocious, poetic, cruel, or simply sad. In these many instances, an interpretive question arises of how much certain adjectives affect the notated rhythms and tempi. This is something I've been thinking about since studying the catalog of birds with pianist Pierre Laurent Amard and his wife Tamara Stefanovich this past summer. In particular, I remember playing the shortest movement, Alouette Lulu, somewhat romantically making full use of rubato and shaping of phrases. One of Amard's first responses was that there was a reason he didn't name the set Impressions of Birds, but rather the Catalog of Birds, since human emotions don't translate to birds. Throughout the week, both of the artists would routinely say that there shouldn't be any projecting of human emotions onto the birds. Catalogue d'Oiseau is a set of pieces that is arguably some of the most abstract music that Messiaen wrote, and also the most literal. It is, quote, abstract enough to be far from the easy programmatic sense of Beethoven, but it is at the same time more cryptic and more exact. End quote. Unlike the Van Regard pour l'enfant Jesu, the catalogue of birds doesn't contain the rock star get on your feet moments, nor the imaginative titles such as Quartet for the End of Times, Tangle of Rainbows for the Angel that Announces the End of Time. It does not contain the driving excitement of the solo cadenzas found in the Tarangalitha Symphony. But rather, in the catalog, what we hear are snippets of bird songs, musical representations of landscapes, and perhaps a bit of a musical account of Messiaen's feelings towards both of these things. To restate, Messiaen's composer-scientist duality involves the combination of his incessant need to attach labels as a scientist with his inclination to write birds into the score with human signifiers. In my interpretation, the appearance of each bird with its human traits then begins to resemble characters, which is an aspect we typically associate with theatricality, narrative, or romanticism in the arts. In terms of actual music notes and rhythmic material, the notation of each bird song transcription is exacting and specific, but at the same time, a representation of musical ecology is reduced to the subjectivity of Messiaen's perception, such as the fact that he hears certain birds' songs as sad or cruel. And I'd like to continue with this idea of the scientist-artist duality in regards to Messiaen, because I find it to be something that composers today explore more than ever. I'd like to make the small argument that it's Messiaen who holds a significant amount of agency in our postmodern view of the arts, which is one that is encompassing of science as a partner in crime rather than a separate field from music. It was the visual artist, Paul Clay, who said, Should the artist concern himself with microscopy, history, paleontology? In the 76 years since Clay's death, we've seen artists concern themselves with even more factors. Current events, cultural phenomenon, nature, politics, social constructs. I think it's our interest in and our awareness of these things that enables contemporary artists to attempt something a bit different from the romantic's utilization of pathos. In the catalog of birds, Messiaen seems to pose the question, why can't there be an artistic intervention into the sciences, or a scientific intervention in the arts? What if fieldwork became the new art loft or practice studio? Today we see an embrace of these ideas 
more and more composers are seeking inspiration from fields that may enhance the scope and relevancy of their compositional ideas. They derive meaning from these non-musical, unrelated fields and translate that meaning into the expression found in their work. It was John Luther Adams who recently said, quote, both the sciences and the arts begin with perception and aspire to achieve understanding. Both science and art search for truth. Both heighten our sense of wonder at the strange beauty, complexity, and unity of creation. Adams' view simply echoes the ideals that Messiaen demonstrated for decades through his art. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to give a little preview of the rest of what you'll hear today. Like music of previous centuries, these works do require the use of one's imaginative faculty. Certain bird songs, the birds' behavioral depictions, and their surrounding landscapes are heard in isolation. They're not melodious and very rarely have any simultaneous harmonic accompaniment. It's simply, quote, a photograph album from bygone times, end quote. Messiaen said of one of the movements. What you'll hear are static musical snapshots without regard to development or transformation of musical ideas. Personally, I feel that the final movement, the curlew, is the most musically compelling and heartfelt piece within the 13 movements of the Catalog of Birds. It's also the darkest and dreariest, both in its transcription of the curlew's sad tremolo or sirenesque glissando calls, and in its evocative depiction of isolation on a small island just off the coast of Normandy. The movement is complete with depictions of churning waves and the routine descent of fog at day's end. These representations are not my own abstractions because, again, Messiaen labels every bit of the score's extra musical material. It almost gives the impression that he was experiencing these things in real time while writing the work. Towards the close of the movement, the only man-made element in the entire catalog, a famous lighthouse, is featured. It's scored with four fortes, so you can't miss it. Considering the function of the lighthouse, to warn sailors of dangerous areas, and the fact that Messiaen labels the curlew's call as a siren, I think it's a fair question to ask, what is the music warning against? Many people who knew Messiaen have spoken about his light, or the sense of an aura surrounding him when he would enter a room. In my opinion, his musical output as a whole is optimistic, full of religious devotion and hopefulness. So why would he end such a large-scale work, that subject matter he found so meaningful, in such a dreary and desolate way? I have my own ideas, but I think it's best if you simply hear and interpret the work on your own first. In conclusion, during his search for authenticity through nature, Messiaen created some of the most original and groundbreaking music written in the latter half of the 20th century. As a pianist, I find that the challenge and uniqueness of the catalog of birds is most apparent in the requirements Messiaen places on pianists. On one hand, I would not say it's greatly pianistic to recreate the sound of a bird or even a foghorn on the keyboard, but on the other hand, there are certain attributes of the piano that make it the only instrument able to realize the catalog most successfully, since more than one note can be played at once and certain overtones are created that allow for more harmonic coloring that can match the sound of non-piano things. Although the music is abstract, and although I'm sure it's music that's still shocking to hear today, I do think it plays a part in broadening and deepening our understanding of nature. In learning these pieces, I've begun to pay more attention to the sounds of nature around me at all times. And I encourage you as well, to take up Messiaen's advice. In my hours of gloom, when I'm suddenly aware of my own futility, when every musical idiom appears to me as no more than admirable, painstaking experimentation without any ultimate justification, what's left for me 
but to seek out the true lost face of music somewhere off in the forest, in the fields, in the mountains, or on the seashore, among the birds. Thank you. <laughs>